SCP-2510, Our Broken Salvation. There are a lot of hidden wars going on in the SCP universe. The wars between the SCP Foundation and various other organizations, such as the Chaos Insurgency, the Invisible War in SCP-2480, the God War that occurred in Daleport, and so on. One of the most notable ongoing wars, however, is the one between the Sarkic Cults and the Church of the Broken God. I've touched upon this in the past in both my Sarkicism video and my Broken God video, but there's a lot more to go into. SCP-2510 is a curious artifact that shows us the extent of this war, its potential culminating effects, and what the Foundation might be able to do to help. 2510 is a massive machine located in the southern Indian Ocean, with 95% of its interior flooded or damaged beyond accessibility. The machine's original purpose is completely unknown, as it is no longer functional. The Foundation has been busy at work reverse engineering parts of the machine, however, resulting in the creation of two new SCPs and replicating the effects of a third. They do know the machine is pretty old, however, as its current situation is the result of rust, sedimentation, volcanic activity, and the structural deformation of the Earth's crust. The machine was first discovered by a navigator in 1772, who claimed the island where the machine is located for the French crown. Nobody really noticed the machine, however, until 1949 when reports emerged of a German auxiliary cruiser that had docked on the island to perform maintenance and replenish water supplies. The crew was harvesting ice off the surface of the island when they struck something artificially constructed. The Germans assumed at first they had discovered an ancient shipwreck, and began excavating it in hopes of finding treasure. The men that returned were delirious, suffering from acute radiation poisoning. Those that survived the ordeal reported finding a machine city. The Foundation of course swooped in, and after extensively researching the anomaly, declared the entire Kerguelen Plateau to be SCP-2510, an area roughly three times larger than Japan. An armed containment site was built around the above ground entrance to 2510 and they soon discovered the existence of SCP-2510-1. 2510-1 is a trans-dimensional gateway powered by an unknown and unaccessible power source, and controlled by an ancient pipe organ. Neither the gateway nor the controlling mechanism seems to be part of the original construction of 2510, instead made with repurposed 2510 parts at some point in the past. By manipulating the system, the gateway can open dimensional portals to a number of different locations. A team was formed consisting of five scientists and commanded by a World War II veteran, Captain Hadley. The team, MTF Alpha 5, Paranauts, had been trained and equipped for transdimensional exploration, and the first expedition occurred on November 15, 1952. Each team member was supplied with suits providing breathable oxygen and were capable of protecting individuals from hazardous material and inhospitable environments. These suits were also tethered back to home base to maintain connection to the life support systems and sustain radio contact. The portal was configured to allow access to the first alternate dimension, and the team entered. Hadley reports that they are in a totally barren landscape dusty and grey, with no signs of life anywhere to be seen. The team's astrophysicist reports that the alignment of the stars coincides with that of Earth, and he guesses they're somewhere near the equator. The team begins to explore the landscape and take what samples they can, but overall it seems pretty empty. After returning, Hadley reports that the soil samples taken were completely devoid of nutrients and the consensus was that all life on this planet was obliterated, down to bacteria. They're not sure what happened, but this is a dead world. 
I know this sounds similar to the situation from SCP-2935, but just wait. Two weeks went by before the second expedition on November 29th, 1952, when the gateway was tuned to the second dimension. A live video feed was set up in addition to the radio contact. Hadley says that they've apparently exited from a washroom in an artificially constructed area similar to a subway tunnel. He says the washroom was disgusting, and he saw a few humans that looked pretty sick, but they are ignoring them and sticking to the shadows. The air here is polluted but breathable, and the team removes some of their heavier life support equipment. The team separates in order to find out as much about the environment as they can. The engineer finds a large amount of graffiti on the walls, which blends in with the architecture of the structures. He says it looks Greek, with a lot of spiral symbols, the most common of which displays three curves emanating from a central point. If this is starting to sound familiar, you might be thinking of SCP-2480, an unfinished ritual, where Dr. Narvaez saw a number of spiral symbols around the town. It's no coincidence that 2480 is heavily involved in sarcasm, and spiral symbols are popping up in this world. The engineer says that although it seems that they were in some sort of underground subway station, there are no rail tracks to be seen. Everything has a glossy reflection, like it's all moist and slimy. Suddenly, the tunnel begins to vibrate, and humans in the area gather at the edge of a platform. A massive, fleshy entity the size of a train moves down the tunnel and up to the platform. It is pale white in appearance, with countless legs, and it chatters and hisses as natives walk into massive holes on its body. Some people also stepped out of it onto the platform, covered in slime. The insect then crawls forward into the tunnels, out of sight. Some of the native humans approach the engineer, staring at him with blank eyes. He attempts to communicate with them, but one of them opens its mouth, unhinging its jaw and revealing more than 60 needle-like teeth. It then screeches in excess of 150 decibels, and all of the locals drop to their hands and knees and scatter into the darkness. The engineer says that it apparently covered their equipment with saliva, and the team regroups to leave. In the post-operation report, we find out a bit more about this strange world. Hadley says that it felt like they were being watched the entire time they were there, but they eventually made it to the surface. They discovered a city teeming with life, but corrects himself to say hive instead. They found black banners everywhere, adorned with a yellow spiral symbol, and the anthropologist said it felt familiar to her somehow. That, of course, is identical to what Dr. Narvaez found in the town of 2480 under the effects of DMT. They also report that the natives stared at them without blinking, and the DNA sample from the saliva on their equipment was mostly human. There were also spires constructed of some sort of organic material that reached up into the sky. If it's not already very obvious, this SCP and 2480 were both written by the same author, and published around the same time. You might just think that this is the alternate dimension bleeding into our world through 2480, but it's a bit more complicated than that, as we'll see. On their way back to the portal, the geologist was scratched by a native, tearing right through her suit. The wound is infected, and she's running up a high fever. On December 6th, the portal was activated to the third dimension, and the team went through, minus their geologist, who is still in critical condition. The team enters into an environment blanketed in a heavy yellow fog that reeks of sulfur. Hadley reports seeing shapes in the haze, and guesses they might be in a forest. They quickly learn that the shapes are not trees but sinewy organisms comprised of flesh. The team begins to hear hundreds of sounds like heartbeats pulsating at different speeds, and the ground shakes. 
The flesh tree in front of them pulls away from the ground, revealing a proboscis with several wiggling tongue appendages. The entity retreats into the sky through unknown means, leaving a gaping hole in the ground. A mass of squirming organic material erupts from the hole and proceeds to slither towards the team. It hurls a bone-like projectile at the camera as Hadley shouts at his team to retreat. They successfully made it back to our dimension, revealing that their microphones had picked up a deep, low sound in the background, chanting in an unknown language. After analyzing a DNA sample taken from the tree-like entity, the result was mostly human. Four days later, the portal was activated to the fourth dimension, and the team began to enter, still minus their geologist. As soon as Captain Hadley entered, however, the portal sealed shut, and would no longer open to that dimension. All attempts to rescue Hadley were unsuccessful, and his fate is completely unknown. Even though Hadley was lost, the Foundation still wanted to know what was through the fifth and final dimension accessible by the portal. On December 20th, 1952, the portal was activated again, but this time it was unusually transparent, allowing the Foundation to see through to the other side. The other side consisted of a cubicle room with a matching appearance to SCP-2510, so the team's engineer volunteered to enter. There were no other exits in this room, and the only thing of note was a heavy bronze object, which was brought back through. The bronze object is a humanoid clockwork automaton of ancient Greek design, with no detectable anomalies. The Foundation found a punch card mechanism, but no obvious means of operating it. The team's engineer and historian worked together for three years to create usable punch cards by translating ancient Greek into a binary system. By inputting single word questions, the device would return a pre-recorded response in ancient Greek. The first question asked was purpose. The response was that this is the final testament of Patriarch Erastos, a servant of Mechon, the broken god. The second question was about Mechon, to which it responded that Mechon is the anvil where we are all forged and perfected. Mechon was sundered to save us, but it is broken, not dead. When asked about the portal, it responds that it, or in this case Erastos, was to shepherd the most talented of the Mechonites south for some reason, but the flesh tormented them. It mentions the Sarkic Demiurge, more commonly known in the SCP universe as Yaldabaoth. Asked about the flesh, the device drops a lot of information, although admittedly it's hard to piece together. Overall, it's not anything new if you're already familiar with the war between the Sarkites and the Church of the Broken God. Sarkites believe that Yaldabaoth, a creator deity, is meant to reform the universe into one of instinctual flesh. Mechanites believe that Mechon is meant to reform the universe into one of logic and order. The two groups don't get along too well. The device specifically mentions both Aditum, an ancient city where Sarcasism was founded, and Grand Carcist Ion, generally considered the founder of Sarcasism. After this, the geologist would die of her infection, believed to be the earliest recorded instance of a certain SCP. The number of the SCP in the article is blacked out, but it's highly likely that this is meant to be SCP-610, the flesh that hates, a biological weapon utilized by the Sarkites. Both the engineer as well as the astrophysicist would go missing, with the astrophysicist last seen rambling about black stars and a fifth world. The engineer injured several personnel while stealing the bronze device, and neither have been seen since. Some were concerned that the death of the geologist affected the two, as they were both close to her. 
The astrophysicist had requested several rare books on the occult prior to his disappearance, including a book with a title that roughly translates to Message of the Black Star. Whether or not this has anything to do with fifthism is anyone's guess, as the article lacks the fifthism tag. He ended up breaking the engineer's nose in a scuffle before disappearing, apparently over a difference of philosophy. Two weeks later, the 2510 site came under attack by the Church of the Broken God forces, and the engineer used the chaos to steal the bronze automaton and escape. Perhaps not a coincidence that the engineer's name was Dr. Maxwell, and one of the branches of the Church of the Broken God devoted to modern technology is called Maxwellism. So, we have some sort of portal system built by followers of the Broken God that allows access to alternate dimensions that seem to all have some sort of sarkic influence. Fortunately, at the bottom of the article, we're given an explanation. Something seems to have hijacked the foundation systems, and opens with a quote written by Zosimos of Panopolis, an Egyptian alchemist who wrote the oldest surviving material we have on alchemy. Zosimos wrote of a dream he had in which he met a man named Ion, who was a priest of the Atatum, and described how Ion dismembered him and burnt him on a fire until his body transformed interesting connection. The individual responsible for hacking the system then goes into an explanation. It says that our iteration of reality continues to exist because we possess the power to lead humanity away from the nightmare. It will tell us what it can, but the whole truth cannot be properly translated to current human understanding. Convenient. It says that there is a universal constant across all realities of light against dark, and a provider of wisdom and intellect that frees us from ignorance. It says that the broken god is not our creator, and is not of our universe, but instead Yaldabaoth, the god of flesh, created us. The broken god was a patient teacher that taught us logic and reason. Again, this was all explained in my Church of the Broken God video. There was a war of cosmic proportions, outside of space and time, where Mechan was destroyed, but as a final act, secured Yaldabaoth within its shattered husk. Pieces of the Broken God scattered across every iteration of our world. Most, if not all, of the anomalies handled by the SCP Foundation are in some way invoked by Yaldabaoth as it rattles within its many cages. The individual tells us that two millennia ago, a priest of Meccan received a vision, that Yaldavoth had crafted six loyal Archons before its fall. These Archons had set in motion a plan to liberate Yaldavoth from its cage. This vision brought the Meccanite priest to a frigid and faraway land, where they would use the husk of the broken god to create a doorway. This doorway would allow access to other iterations of our world where the seals grew corrupted. In other words, worlds where the Mechanites failed to win the war against the Sarkites. In the first dimension we saw, the desolate landscape, the Mechanites used parts of the Broken God to forge a weapon that cleansed the world of all life. Certainly a victory against the Sarkites but not exactly what you'd call a huge success. In the second dimension, the weird subway tunnel in Hive City, the Mechanites lost a key victory early on in their war, which they won in most other realities. This quickly led to a world run by the Sarkites, where an aspect of Yaldabaoth broke free. Pretty much the same thing happened in the third dimension, with the Yellow Fog, but a slightly different result. In the end, only the original prophet that had the vision of the doorway was left, and he was visited by an angel of invention. This angel helped him create that bronze automaton, and he put it in a pocket plane in the fifth dimension, which was another world beyond saving. The fourth dimension, however, the one where Captain Hadley disappeared into, 
is apparently a reality devoid of anomalies, with no corruption by Yaldabaoth. In this reality, humanity achieved a technological singularity 20,000 years ago, combining Neanderthals, Homo sapiens, and SCP-1000, the Children of the Night, into one unified civilization. This civilization managed to spread across the stars, and joined up with other sapient races, bringing peace and harmony across the galaxy. The individual finishes its message by saying that we could sacrifice our world like the first dimension, or fail to protect it like the others, or we could succeed like the fourth dimension. Our reality is apparently the last one whose fate has not been decided, and if Yaldabaoth breaks free in our reality, the scales will be tipped in its favor, manifesting in every possible reality. The individual mentions that there are some on their side that believe they must act against us, perhaps torching our world entirely to prevent the Sarkites from winning. It offers us an ultimatum, to discard our organic prisons and become a part of the divine machine, or face the consequences of our inaction. It ends by saying that God is broken so that we might be whole, and signs off with Brother Hadlius. I think we know what happened to Captain Hadley. So basically, this portal was designed to look at all the other versions of our world, and see in which ones the Mechanites won, and which ones the Sarkites won. This way they could figure out the best way to win the war. Unfortunately, things don't look good for the Mechanites, as the Sarkites seem to be dominating the multi-dimensional war. There is this one dimension, however, that seems pretty good, with super advanced technology, awesome spacefaring adventures, and peace for everyone. They just had to discard all the fleshy stuff that makes us human. Honestly, it all sounds a bit too good to be true. While we certainly could take this as clear evidence that the Mechanites are all completely awesome and on the level and just want to help out humanity, it's hard to be sure. It definitely doesn't look like the Sarkic life is all that great either, but the Foundation aren't jumping to answer the Mechanite's call. SCP-2510 is absolutely connected to SCP-2480, but not to the point of knowledge of one is required for the other. It seems that the Sarkites are working on multiple angles to corrupt our world in order to win the war, one being the spread of SCP-610, and another being the blending of our reality with one where Sarkicism already won, through SCP-2480. In the end, it's just another fascinating SCP, and another piece of the Mechanite and Sarkic puzzle. At this point, there will likely need to be a whole separate canon, in which this war comes to a climax in our reality. But for now, we at least got a glimpse of the endgame.